want to welcome everybody tonight. Uh, you have uh, turned out in good shape. Looks like we have a, a, a little bit bigger crowd than sometimes, and not as big as some other times. <laughs> but we're, we're grateful for everybody that came. Uh, the last time you saw Michael Blakesley here at the Historical Society, he was a Civil War reenactor. And Debbie came in her uh, Civil War uh, finery. And uh, we had a good time then. But he's regressed since that point. And he's gone back to revolutionary times. Michael Blakesley married Deborah Brown, who grew up in Bristol. Uh, Michael is from Connecticut, but he has some interesting artifacts that he's going to talk about, but his basic premise tonight is the religious aspects of the Revolutionary War period. And I've, I, I wrote down what you are actually involved with right now. He's the chaplain of the Warner Regiment Extra Continental Line. Whatever that means, he, he may explain that to us. Um, but <coughs> Mike, Michael is uh, a chaplain, and uh, so you may get a sermon. We had him. We had him at the Starksboro Meeting House, and he uh, he gave a sermon. That was Civil War. That was Civil War. Uh, when we were celebrating at that point, but uh, I don't know what he's going to do. We just told him that we're in his hands. Michael, welcome. Thank you. As uh, Mr. Burbank said, I am the um, chaplain of Seth Warner's Regiment, Extra Continental Line. Um, we just last week um, um, defeated the British in the Battle of Bennington, which was a rousing victory. We uh, um, managed to pretty much wipe out the Hessians and the British soldiers. And between Hubberton and the Battle of Bennington, we de um, depleted the army, the British army, of over a thousand soldiers. Who knows where that'll lead in the future, but I, I think that within the coming weeks um, and months, you will hear of another um, continental victory and uh, as we move forward towards our cause of liberty. Historically, where have we come from to get to this point where we are trying to break our ties to the King of England? And it's a long story. And it goes back to the early, uh, the early colonial days with the um, Puritans and the Puritans coming over from England trying to break with the Church of England um, and trying to establish their own religious freedom here on this continent. And in so doing, um, they started kind of a rift between us and England. As time went on, um, something that happened about uh, 40, 50 years ago called the Great Awakening. And there was a great revival in this country. And people um, started to break really from the Church of England and start those that weren't aligned with any church. Um, it, was, it was a revival. People came to find religion and in whatever form they found it, it no longer involved the King of England. Now, historically, the King of England or the Pope has been the head of the church. If you're Catholic, it's the Pope. If you're English, it was the King of England. And um, in uh, 1762, the English government um, tried to establish a bishop of the Church of England that was to come to New England and take over the congregational churches and return them back to the Church of England because um, the king had felt that, that um, we were breaking away from him. And the Congregationalists and the Presbyterians, as a matter of fact, one of his comments was that the upcoming problems or the problems we're having now is really a Presbyterian war. Mm -hmm. um, that's not really true, but what the Great Awakening did is it put in people's minds that you don't really need to have the king or a pope between you and God. And that started the path of um, 
Do we really need to be under English control? The French and Indian War um, was a war against the French that were north of us and down the Champlain Valley. Um, they were harassing our ships on the sea. They were coming down and interfering with our trade along the New England coast. Um, we had, um, in the 1740s, captured Louisburg on the tip of Cape Breton Island. A New England force captured one of the strongest French um, cities in, uh, in the New World. And there was a treaty a few years later that gave it back to the French. So um, with the French and Indian War, with the English winning, with a lot of us fighting in that war, or our fathers fighting in that war, um, we defeated them and at the expense of the British government, which incurred a huge debt. Now we felt that that was part of them being over us. The British government felt that, oh, wait a minute, these people need to pay for this war. So they started taxing. And they started closing ports. They closed the port of Boston um, because some of the people in Boston threw tea into the, into the water. And um, they had a party where they, the, um, some of the colonists who were angry with the British government um, boarded ship dressed as Native Americans and um, the Indians threw the tea into the harbor so that they lost all that revenue from the tea tax. So the British government said, well, until you pay that, I'm closing the port of Boston. They also had a stamp act. Stamp act. Act. <laughs> um, the stamp act um, said that you had to have an official tax stamp on all paper goods. Not only books, legal documents, right down to playing cards. If you bought a deck of playing cards, you had to pay a tax. We were being taxed unfairly because we didn't have representation in Europe. So all of these civil reasons were playing into what was happening and um, people's dander were getting up and we've about had it with the king so we're fighting to be independent. Why do we feel we need to be independent? Because God made us to be independent. If you go back to the Old Testament, when the Jewish nation started asking for a king, God said, you don't need a king. It's in 1 Samuel, where God said, this is what's going to happen when you get a king. And I will read to you from, this is a book that almost everyone has read. It's called Common Sense by Thomas Paine. And in it, Excuse me, now that I'm older, I need assistance when I go to read. Um, but the general manner of the kings of the earth, whom Israel so eagerly copying after, and notwithstanding the great distance of time and difference of manners, the character is still in fashion. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people. And those words... Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, and Samuel told all the word, and he said, This shall be the manner of the king that shall reign over you, and this is the manner of all kings. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. This description agrees with the present mode of impressing men. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear, ear to the, his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. This describes the expense and luxury as well as the oppression of kings. And he will take your fields and your olive yards 
even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give them to his officers and to his servants. By which we see that bribery, corruption, and favoritism are the standing vices of kings. And he will take the tenth of your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. And he will take a tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants and ye shall cry out on that day because of your king which ye shall have chosen. King George III is of that nature. He feels that we are his. He feels that our land is his. He denies us our liberties. He denies us the liberty to go to churches as we choose. Um, so the ministers, the servants of the Lord, have risen up across this country and are preaching sermons that are encouraging the populace. Um, there's been some very strong sermons coming out of the churches of Boston, coming out of the churches of all over New England, um, talking about the attributes of God and how God has endowed us with liberty. Even the deists agree um, that God has endowed man with moral character and moral judgment and um, that even though they feel that God's kind of wandered away, um, everyone agrees that God has given man moral liberty to make his own choices and that the king of England is usurping the right of God and turning it over to himself instead of allowing men their free choice. So the churches are deeply, deeply involved in um, this matter of the civil unrest with England. We will have liberty in this country. We will have the right to overthrow tyrants who seem to tell us what we can do, where we can spend our money, that their money is ours. Do you know that if you own land in the province of Maine or in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, before you can cut down pine trees, you have to have a surveyor from the English government come and tell whether that tree is worthy of being amassed on an English ship. And if it is, they mark it with a broad ax. And you're not allowed to use that wood. Can you imagine you own that piece of land? You have dearly cleared it. You built a house. You're living there. Your family is there. And you can't use all of its resources because the British government might need one of your trees for a mast. It's incredible, <laughs> just incredible. So the churches are buying into this. Now, almost every town in New England has a meeting house. And a meeting house is a place where the town comes together for town business. But on Sunday, the different congregations within the town meet at that meeting house. Each has a different time period. And um, some of them, um, some of the towns only have congregational church in the town. And um, it's quite normal that you would come in and you would sing a few hymns from Mr. Watts um, or from his hymnal. And then you would have a sermon, um, break for lunch, and then come back for the second part of the sermon. Um, Depending on where you are in the country, church attendance varies. If you're in a city, church attendance is close to 80%. If you're in the country, you have a circuit pastor. And you may not have a service every Sunday except for what you put together. It's a very complex thing. But the nice thing about a circuit pastor is he goes from town to town to town. So he can give you the messages. He can tell you... Do you know the British are oppressing this group here, or they're oppressing this group here? Um, they can carry that kind of message. You know, all of us pride ourselves on our homes. We like the privacy of our homes. We like to be able to have our possessions that the Lord allows us to have. And um, But the king has issued a decree, and at his will, he can board soldiers in your house. Now that may not seem like too bad of a thing, but it really is. The soldiers staying in your house are privy to your private 
conversations to your private business. If you speak out against the king, you're liable to be flogged. You're liable to be arrested. It's a terrible time. Terrible time. And the church ministers, the pastors, the preachers are all caught up in promoting this liberty, promoting this cause. Even some of the Episcopal pastors are starting to come around and they're making a break from the King of England. Now the Episcopal Church and the Episcopal ministers swear an allegiance to the King. That's part of their theology. They actually, their statement of faith um, states obedience to the king, in this case, George III. They are starting, the ones that are in favor of and seeing what's happening in this country are starting to break from the Church of England and establish their own Episcopal church, Anglican church. The same thing's happening with the Methodist Episcopal. The Congregationalists and their form, which arose out of Puritanism, is an independent church. Every church is independent. Every church worships as it feels it should, as that community feels it should. The ministers that are called there are independent and they um, have gone to school. Some of them have been apprenticed. Some of them have actually gone to a seminary. and. When they come to a church, they are bound to the congregation and no one else. It's a very interesting time. Um, and because of that, there's a lot of independent groups coming up as well. There's Baptists that are starting to come into the country, although they're, the Baptists aren't quite treated very fairly as, composed, as opposed to the um, Presbyterians. The Baptist churches have to pay a tax to support the congregational churches for the amount of income that they are losing because people belong to the Baptist church. Um, and some states um, have mandated that, um, that the churches are Protestant. New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Maine, um, the only rightful ministers are Protestant ministers. And, um, and that's well and, and good because um, the French and Indian War was really not only a war against France, it was a war against the papacy. Um, the, the, we were afraid. We've already broken ties with the Roman Church. And here they are up in Canada um, and it bothers us greatly that they're up there. Well, at the end of the French and Indian War, at the end of the war, um, the British government told them that they could continue their Roman Catholic papacy, which was very concerning, very concerning to us down in New England, um, to have papists right on the northern border. Um, and there are actually some actually starting to move into New England again. So it's, it's all a very interesting time. But as we develop this country, it's important that everyone has the liberty to worship as they feel right. So even though we may disagree with what they're worshiping, I disagree with the deists. I feel that God still is active in our world. But the deists have a right to worship as they feel fit. Um, I'm not really sure about the atheists, where they are. Um, there's very few of them, but um, they're mostly naturalists and trying to find an answer for God out of revealed nature. And um, it's, it's a very interesting thought process that they have. It's not one that most of us have or anyone that I know, but I know they're out there. I know the deists are out there. So as a minister, as a minister in a major church, um, like in Boston, you would be preaching for the revolution, for liberty. You would be spending your two hours on a Sunday morning um, speaking about, from the Bible, um, why God is on the side of the American colonies. 
And there are even some people who feel if we win this war, it may be the start of the millennium. The millennium where Jesus is in charge of the earth. That the United Colonies, when they get developed, may be the start of that. This may be the impetus for Christ coming back in, in the thousand year reign. Who knows? Um, I don't personally feel that. I think that there has to be some other things that happen first, but there are good, faithful congregational ministers who are preaching along that line. So, um, where are we? Well, a lot of pro prominent ministers are taking up the cause to such a degree that they're leaving their churches and going off to battle with the troops. I am representing doing that. I am representing my home church on the battlefield with Seth, Warner, Seth Warner's regiment. Um, it is my job to take care of the soldiers. But every Sunday, I preach a message that is um, for the troops, to build them up, to keep them on their moral way. Um, and it always involves leading them through, um, through the word in a direction towards supporting the revolution. So I'm going to talk to you here about one of those. I'll give you a little piece of one of them so you can get a taste of what it was like. Just keep bending. I've got to go to a better doctor next time. <laughs> Um, Galatians 5.1 is the basis for this particular message. Um, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And 5.13, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty as an occasion for the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We as a people are called to liberty, called as a people to freely live as Christ has called us to live, free from the oppression of a tyrant that tells us how to live, how to worship, how to spend our money. Look to the Old Testament time and time again, the kings of Israel and Judah turned from God and as we have seen in George III, they did what was right in their own eyes. This always had led to judgment and destruction. It was then as it is now. Righteous men, such as yourselves, gave up their personal lives to return people to the path God has chosen. Such is the role of righteous men, to overthrow the yokes of kings and tyrants who seek to usurp the authority of God and Christ. For Christ is the head of the church, not George III. Christ is the leader of men's lives, not George III. Can anyone forget how he, in 1762, appointed and sent to take an agent to take control of the churches in the American colonies? It is right and good to join this fight against tyranny. It is necessary and just for the godly to oppose the evil in this world. It is also of utmost importance that those of us engaged in the fight against the evil of tyranny not fall into the snares of the evil one and thereby fall into the sin which we are fighting. Therefore, as Paul goes on to say to the Galatians, walk in the Spirit and live by the fruit of the Spirit. That is just an excerpt of what would normally be a two-hour message. But as you can tell from the tone, that message was originally, as a little aside, uh, given in Newport, Rhode Island in 1776. So, um, portions of that. So, um, that is the kind of thing people were hearing from their pulpits. That was the kind of things that they were taking to their hearts. Um, they knew about the intolerable acts that had caused um, politically the war. They knew about the Boston Massacre where unarmed men were fired upon by the British soldiers. They knew about the quartering 
acts. They knew about impression. Almost everyone knew of somebody who knew of somebody who knew of somebody who had been impressed into service in the British Army. And we, as the clergy, have a right to lead our people. We have a right under Christ to lead our people towards the liberty which is their just desert for living a life on this earth. That is how religion is getting caught up in the American Revolution. It's becoming part of the cause of the war, and it's becoming part of the encouragement of the war and part of the encouragement of the soldiers. So, how does this play into everyday lives of people? Well, number one, if you lived in a small town and your, your pastor's gone off to be a chaplain, the people in the community have to cover for that pastor. Um, that reverend is paid still by his church, if he's paid. <laughs> um, and, but he's still paid by his church. So they have to, they're paying the chaplain. The chaplain has to provide for himself in the field. He's treated as an officer, um, but generally receives no pay, especially here in Vermont um, in the uh, Warner Regiment, which is the Green Mountain Boys. Um, we haven't seen a paper payment, not only real money payment um, yet. Um, we do get to divide up whatever plunder we get from um, the soldiers like the Hessians down in um, uh, Hubberton and again at Bennington over just over the border. Um, you know, if, if you look at the lives of these people, the average chaplain lasted at most six months. Um, part of it is the death and discouragement and um, being away from their home churches, number one, but um, as the, the pastor, the chaplain that was at Mount Independence was doing two, three, four, sometimes up to a dozen um, funerals a day um, because of the death from smallpox and cold and disease. Um, that can take a really wear on a person. Um, plus, he's, um, he's the one that's trying to keep up the morale of the soldiers when he himself, his morale may be plummeting. So most chaplains live, last two to three months, at the most six months with the Army. There are some who last a long time that are really um, into it. Um, there's a chaplain from Connecticut, um, no, Massachusetts, Thomas Allen, who is called the fighting chaplain. And he was at Mount Independence and with the evacuation from Mount Independence went down to Hubberton. Um, at the Hubberton battlefield, he actually picked up a musket from a downed soldier and started to fight. A good many of the chaplains um, fight. And then he quit. He was upset that they had abandoned Ticonderoga. He felt that it could have been held. He um, gave a very rousing speech, which I'll read to you later, um, which um, touted keeping the forts, standing up against the British. And then the commander said, nice, um, we're leaving in the morning. Um, <laughs> so they went to Hubberton. He fought at Hubberton and then quit. But he shows up at Bennington with his own militia from Massachusetts. He was asked by um, General Stark to come. And when he showed up, he said, now that I'm here with my men, am I going to get to fight? And um, Stark said, well, I'll tell you what, if in the next couple of days you don't get to fight, then you can go away and I will never ask you for anything again. And that company um, was very active in the Battle of Bennington. It's kind of interesting when he went back to his home church, one of his parishioners, um, a little upset that he went upon learning that he actually fought, um, said, did you kill anyone? And he said, well, I'll tell you, there was somebody in the bushes 
and every time they shot, one of our soldiers would fall. So I shot at the bush, and I don't know what happened, but there was never any more shooting from that bush. <laughs> that was his answer. So, um, this is, it's kind of a unique situation because um, the Congregational and Presbyterian ministers are so caught up in this cause of liberty for these colonies and not wanting to be under control of the king that it drives a good many of the services. Old North, North Church in Boston, um, the minister there just every Sunday was wailing on the cause of liberty and the need for every able-bodied person to do his share. And uh, that was very characteristic through the entire colonies. Um, north of New Jersey or so, well, it was almost entirely Congregational and Presbyterian. South was Episcopal. But as the Southern Anglican um, Church started to come under assault of the British, and they pleaded for um, some assistance from the crown. The crown refused to help them. They started to break away from the Church of England and in fact wrote out a new confession of faith which um, gave their obedience to Christ and God and not to King George III, which was a huge break for that group of people. Um, so, I'd like to read to you, um, before I start going on towards questions, I don't know how I'm doing for time, because, oh, well. <laughs> so this is the speech that Mr. Allen gave at Mount Independence in Fort Ticonderoga the night before those forts were abandoned. Valiant soldiers, yonder, pointing to the enemy that lay in sight, are the enemies of your country who have come to lay waste and destroy and spread havoc, <clears throat> devastation through this pleasant land. They are enemies hired to do the work of death and have no motive to animate them in their undertaking. You have every consideration to induce you to play the man and act the part of valiant soldiers. Your country looks up to you for its defense. You are contending for your wives, whether you or they shall enjoy them. You are fighting for your children, whether they shall be yours or theirs. Your houses and lands, for your flocks and herds, for your freedom, for future generations. For everything that is great and noble, on account of which only life itself is worth a fig. You must, you will abide the day of trial. You cannot give back while animated by these considerations. Suffer me, therefore, on this occasion to recommend to you without delay to break off your sins by righteousness and your iniquity by turning unto the Lord. Turn ye, turn ye ungodly sinners, for why will ye die? Repent, lest the Lord come and smite you with a curse. Our camp is filled with blasphemers and resounds with the language of the infernal regions. Oh, that officers and men might fear to take the holy and tremendous name of God in vain. Oh, that you would now return to the Lord, lest destruction should come upon you, lest vengeance overtake you. Oh, that you were wise, that you understood this in your latter end. I must recommend to you the strictest attention to your duty and the most punctual obedience to your officers. Discipline, order, and regularity are the strength of the army. Valiant soldiers, should our enemy attack us, I exhort you and conjure you to play the man. Let no danger appear too great. Let no suffering appear too severe for you to encounter for your bleeding country. God's grace assisting me, I am determined to fight and die by your side rather than flee before our enemies or resign myself to them. Prefer death to captivity. Ever remember your unhappy brethren made prisoners at Fort Washington, whose blood now crieth to heaven for vengeance, and shakes the pillars of the world, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not charge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? 
Rather than quit this ground with infamy and disgrace, I should prefer leaving this body of mine a corpse upon the spot. I must finally recommend to you and urge it on you again and again in time of action to keep silence, but all be hushed and calm, serene and tranquil, that the Lord of the that the word of the command may be distinctly heard and resolutely obeyed, and may the God of heaven take us all under his protection and cover our heads in this day of battle and grant us unto his salvation. So you can tell how easily it is to mix the patriotic cause with the cause of the Lord for the chaplains and how necessary it is to those people to understand that message. So that's it from the 18th century. <laughs> I brought some things for you to look at. Um, uh, of course, Common Sense by Thomas Paine. In this time period, there are three books that the average household that could read had. The Bible, Pilgrim's Progress, and Common Sense. Um, it's interesting, Pilgrim's Progress was used in the schools. Um, as, a, as a reader. Um, it was very, very common that most people who hadn't read any other book in their entire life have read Pilgrim's Progress. Um, so I have that. Um, I have my reproduction Bible from the period. This is a 1611. It's an exact copy reprint of the King James Bible from 1611. Um, which, if you really want to have a difficulty reading a difficult passage, this is the book to read, because <laughs> even the letters aren't the right letters. <laughs> um, Isaac Watts. This is the hymnal that was in major use at the time of the American Revolution. Um, you'll notice that the songs in here do not have music. There was common music. And one thing that I'm trying to learn to do um, and practicing is to line read hymns. So what the minister would do is they would sing a line with the congregation quiet, and then they would sing it together. And then he would sing a line, and they would sing it together. And quite often, they would make up their own tunes. <laughs> This is an original um, copy of the Watts hymnal of the period. It's a little worm-eaten. Um, I'm going to put modern glasses on. I hope you don't mind. This is a book printed in Vermont, actually in Randolph in 1810, but it's called The Patriot's Monitor for Vermont. And it's a book for school children, and it's written for school children to remind them, I'll see, designed to impress and perpetuate the first principles of the revolution on the minds of the youth, together with some important and interesting um, facts, and um, adapted for use. It's by Ignatius Thomas, um, and it goes through um, George Washington's addresses, each of his speeches, um, and then in the back, as you get towards into it, um, it talks about the necessity um, on religious toleration, on love to God. Um, so that's in there. I have um, the practice of physics from 1771. Um, I have a treatise on the care of horses by Her Majesty's Farrier. Um, also from, um, well, this is 1791, 1791 as well. A book of Pilgrim's Progress from the period, Schoolmaster's Guide from the period that actually belonged to one of my ancestors, and, um, and a book on physics and surgery from the period. So you're welcome to come up and look at them. I have two muskets. Um, one of them is a 1763 Charleville. This is a 
reproduction. But um, this is the standard arm, one of the standard arms of the Continental Soldier. And it's a 69 caliber, which meant the piece of lead that it was firing was almost seven tenths of an inch in diameter. Um, smooth bore. So if you were hit by one of these beyond 50 yards, it was God's fate because they did not shoot well at all. <laughs> and this is an original um, fusel fin of the type that any New England farmer would have. He might well have captured this in Canada during the French and Indian War. It was manufactured about 1740 in France, um, 62 caliber. And you're welcome to pick it up. I'll oil it tonight when I get home. But um, you'll see how very light this is. And this is the kind of gun that most of the um, New England farmers that showed up for duty had. And um, so, and it still sparks. So. Is that one also smooth for? They're, yes, they're both smooth bore. Rifles were very uncommon, uh, simply because it took so long to load a rifle. So if you're under attack by the Indians, um, there's, it takes too long to load a rifle because you, you're sitting there, you're trying to jam the ball down into the rifling. Whereas a smooth bore, you can load and fire three times a minute. So, and you actually get pretty good with these. Um, these uh, are fairly accurate smooth bores, and they're, um, uh, the average Vermont or New England farmer would use that to hunt deer. And um, the nice thing about a smooth bore is if you decide to go out and get a turkey, you load it with shot instead of ball, and um, you have a shotgun. So, and with a long barrel like that, you get a very tight pattern. So, questions? Yes. Do you happen to know um, what part, if any, the Shaker movement had in the quest for liberty? Um, I don't. The Shakers aren't, I don't think they were a really prominent group by the, at the Revolutionary War. The Quakers <clears throat> were, and the Quakers, because of their pacifist nature, and Shakers are an offshoot of the, of the Quakers, um, they didn't take an active participation in the war. However, they did choose not to hinder the production or the, the progress of the war. So you didn't see them going over to the British, but on the other hand, they didn't typically join to fight. No. Uh, you mentioned that <clears throat> south of New England, uh, uh, the uh, Episcopals were prevalent, but isn't it true that uh, states, uh, areas like Maryland was actually settled by mostly Catholic people? There are some Catholics, yes. The Scottish. And how did they approach the revolution? The Catholics um, are mixed. Um, they they tended to actually join in the revolutionary cause because they had no love for George the Third either, um, and they were under the Pope. I have not found any reference to the Pope coming out on either side of the conflict. Um, and I've done a lot of reading on it, and I, ha I can't see that. But yeah, the Scottish influence down there um, had a lot of Catholic with it. Um, and uh, the, uh, the French pretty much, the French in northern New England had all gone back up to Canada after the French and Indian War. There wasn't much of any of them left in Vermont, um, although some kind of trickled back on down. Um, and you start to see some French Catholics in northern New York uh, before you see them in Vermont, on, um, in the Adirondacks. So, does that answer? Okay. All right. Yes? Where did you get your clothes? <laughs> they, they look, you look magnificent. I hand Clothing sewed them. <laughs> I really did. Uh, I hand sewed. The coat um, is um, typical of the period. It's actually a little bit out of style for the 1770s, um, but not badly. And the vest is silk. 
um, which is exactly correct for the period. And, um, and so the, bre the breeches are linen. Linen does not hold the black dye as well as some of the other stuff does. So um, the wool and um, silk hold the black dye much better than the linen, which has become kind of a brownish. Um, so, and the shoes, I did not make the shoes. <laughs> Although I do have a pair at home um, that was made for me by a gentleman in Colchester. Um, which are now 25 years old, and uh, uh, nice that they're straight last, so I can switch f which feet they're on, um, so they wear evenly. But, uh, <laughs> so. uh, Thank you, Michael. Oh, thank you. <laughs> a bit <laughs> and fortunately it's something that the people who are in this hobby really love and they feed off of each other as well. Um, the unit I belong to now, Seth Warner's Ranger Company, asked me for quite a while to join um, and um, we talked about it off and on and for a number of reasons I, I just joined after I retired from the University of Vermont Medical Center. So, um, it's, I started with history and reenacting in high school, um, and then stopped when my children were very young, but um, when they got to be 10, 11, 12 years old, my boys um, were involved in reenacting with us. So, one of my high school teachers, um, was in fact a Revolution War archaeologist and um, and a reenactor. So. Now, which did you start with, the Civil War or the Revolutionary War? When I started, I started with French and Indian, uh -huh. and then went into Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, we had for a long time a two-war limit on the house because <laughs> <laughs> my wife wanted me home some of the time. I don't know why, but she did. So um, that was, uh, did those two wars, and then once I retired, I've kind of fallen away from French and Indian War, and um, I'm really enjoying the Revolutionary War. And uh, last week, uh, I was at the um, reenactment, 240th anniversary of the Battle of Bennington, and, uh, which was really... We were on the original grounds, which was um, a very eye-opening experience. What's that word extra attached to continental mean? It means that they weren't really part of the continental line, but they're um, a sanctioned unit of the continental line. So that word was used in those days? Yeah. Yep. That's an exact <clears throat> title for this unit. And they were the Green Mountain Boys. So um, Seth Warner was in command. and. Mm -hmm. um, he was elected commander by um, the Vermont delegation, and uh, they chose him over Ethan Allen, which didn't make Ethan Allen very happy at all. But uh, that's Ethan Allen, a um, very bright gentleman, uh, tended to be not very politically correct at times, and pretty much spoke what he thought. And, um, whereas Seth Warner was a little more metered, a little more soft in his approach, and <coughs> that's part of the reason they felt he could get along with people more. Ethan Allen. That is a good quality. Yes. That is good. It is a good quality, one we should all look for in our leaders. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we as an American people continue to have the need to watch for tyrants and um, be cautious in our dealings with government. And that is part of the nature of what an American citizen should be. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.